Hi Rachel. Hello. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do and Coro Kids, please? Yeah, um, so I set up Coro Kids last year, um, r- roughly around about March, although these things are always a little bit uh, on the piece of string when you get going. And um, the purpose of Coro Kids is really to help working parents with childcare. Right. I had a baby myself and um, I was working as a CEO of a healthcare company at the time. And um, I discovered not only how expensive childcare was, but also just what a complete pain it was to set up. And meanwhile, I was seeing that a lot of my friends were struggling with the same kind of issues with babies and toddlers. And then I was seeing some of my friends with older kids who were at school, and they still seemed to be having problems with mm-hmm. sorting out childcare for their, for their kids as well. So it seemed like it didn't even stop. The challenges didn't even stop when kids went to school. And um, so... Because my background was in healthcare, I um, was used to lots and lots of people trying to work on these things and solve them. And I looked around and tried to see who was looking, who was trying to solve these issues that I was seeing in childcare. And I didn't see anything that I thought that, that's the answer. So I decided to found it myself. And so what we do is two services. The first service is for babies and toddlers we do nanny shares. And what that means is that you have one nanny looking after children from two different families at once. <laughs> the advantage is that um, you, uh, each of the families pays about a third less for their nanny. Meanwhile, the kids get to be looked after together, which is really lovely and fun for them. And the nanny actually gets paid 25% more, so it's a win-win-win. And what we do is we set up the match between the families. Mm-hmm. If they need to find a nanny, we help them do that, and then we do all the back office for them. So we do the contract, the tax, the payroll, the payments. Right. So it's a full end-to-end service for nanny check. We we just recently launched our second service, which is um, specifically after school. And uh, for after school, the nannies are slightly different. They're university students, and we train them ourselves. So we bring them into our offices. We do an intensive training course with them. Give the pediatric first aid training as well as. Um, checking their backgrounds, checking their references, all that, and uh, and then we match the families and then we support them to be after school nannies. Right. Sounds like you're running an intense marketplace idea. It is. Yeah. And so between supply and demand, what's what's more challenging for you? I think um, in childcare, the demand is constant. And because of the state of the industry at the moment, because there really isn't a lot of quality out there, um, one of my strong core beliefs is that if you can sort out quality supply, then you win. Mm -hmm. So we actually don't have a problem on the demand side. Um, Childcare is not, in general, not a discretionary purchase. It's a huge purchase. It's a huge share of it, especially in the UK. Especially in the UK, um, working parents are spending almost as much on childcare as they do on their mortgage. So it's a huge amount of money, but um, if they need childcare, they need childcare. And so there's a kind of a constant demand, it's not discretionary. And, um, and what we didn't see was consistent supply, and so that's what we're focusing on. Which doesn't mean that in every part of London, uh, there is a, an excess of demand. So we do have some parts of London. One of the interesting things about doing what I do is I've got to know the map of London quite well and I get to know the different characteristics of different parts of London. So in some of the really wealthy areas like um, Hampstead, Highgate, that kind of place, you have a lot of people, a lot of wealthy families that want high quality childcare. You don't have many nannies living in that area. So there there's a particular supply demand for that. East London is the opposite. So there's quite a few people who would be willing to work as child carers who live in East London, but the demand for private child care is much lower in East London. There are some parts of London that are almost child care deserts, so those tend to be the places where there's been a sudden change in demographics. So the, the one that really sticks out when you look at it on the map is Walthamstow. Walthamstow is a part of London that um, has suddenly become a lot more desirable over the last sort of three or five years. And so you had it, and, and it, but, but it was it was it was kind of cheap and hipster for a while. So you had a lot of people moving there. A lot of people have just had babies. So it wasn't just a huge baby boom in the last year or two. And the childcare infrastructure does not exist to support the baby boom that's happened. So you have many, many families who love Walthamstow. They bought houses. They actually can't afford to move out of Walthamstow. They don't want to. 
and um, the nursery places are just not there for those people. So, in, in, there's a couple of other parts of London, and I can see them starting to come through. Peckham is another one, actually, where you had a where you had a sudden increase in, in the desirability of that location and a sudden um, uh, kind of influx of families, and there you have a supply demand mismatch. Lovely. So, how does the Koru Kids solution address that? And uh, what are the latest experiments that you're doing to tweak the product? So what's interesting to me about Nanny Share is nannies, if, nannies, if you compare the alternative to a nanny, which might be a nursery, mm -hmm. nurseries are not very mobile. You know, you set up a nursery, you're not going to move the nursery, right? Whereas a nanny is, is very mobile. You know, most nannies are very happy to travel within half an hour of where they live. So what that means is that nannies, because they're people, um, can move very easily around London and can take a different demand. So while it might take a long time to get a nursery, some nurseries set up in Walthamstow, it actually doesn't take that long to get some nanny shares going in, in Walthamstow because the nannies from the surrounding areas can come in. Lovely. What is the challenge that you face on a day-to-day -day basis conveying the quality of the service and having, having the vision that you do to parents or to your uh, nannies? I think that the, the, the challenges that we're facing are ones that anyone who has tried to scale up something operational would recognize, whether it's a restaurant or a hospital or anything. So we are growing so fast right now. So we had a thousand families join up before we even launched. And then um, in the very, very quickly after we launched, we had another 2,000 families join up. So in order to just build the core team to service those people, and we um, are incredibly rigorous about our nannies that we train ourselves. So we have a very um, engineered, perhaps over-engineered pipeline of how we recruit and how we evaluate nannies at every stage. So we have, um, just to take our after school as an example, we, um, we recruit, we interview, we do references, we bring them in to our offices, and at each of these stages, we give them a grading against a set of evaluation criteria. So by the time they get all the way through that, if they make it through that pipeline, we have spent a lot of time very intensively like checking their quality and trying to increase their quality through training. And just to make all of that work, is easy to write on a piece of paper, but in reality, um, just the coordination of comms and just making sure that all the tasks get done is tough. So that's what we're working on at the moment, is how do we scale up and be able to do this many, many times over in a really repeatable way to keep that high quality. That, that, that's what I spend most of my day thinking about. Right. You referenced the challenge of scale in other industries. And usually these industries are affected by the ecosystem they operate in. So at a systems change level, what do you think would be the most helpful in terms of policy or research or any other line uh, that could help the specific business you're in, Koru Kids, or Nanny Care? I think there's quite a few things. I mean, one thing that we, I would love to think about more in the future is what is the pedagogy of what we're delivering? I think there's a really interesting opportunity to start delivering what I think of as a distributed nursery. Firstly, I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done at the nursery level anyway to do with curriculum and, um, and what kids should be learning where. I think there are some really major unanswered questions like at what age should children start um, learning to read, for example, and there are wildly divergent kind of theories and a lot of evidence on either side of these of these questions and so to have a clear point of view about that I think in the nursery sector for a start would be really useful but beyond that I think you could then do something with actually providing that to in-home care as well as nurseries I think there's some really interesting work to be done around what kind of curriculum um, maybe curriculum is the wrong word because maybe curriculum implies too much of a school-based philosophy. Maybe that's maybe that's the wrong way to think about it. But I really mean like a learning and development structure, however you want to think about it. That how, how can you bring that into in-home and how can you support people to deliver that? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, the other thing that is not so much about education but just would be helpful is um, there's a lot of strange kind of regulatory and... Um, tax 
work so that we are constantly having to twist and turn our business model not for reasons that help families not for reasons that help children but just to, to comply with with regulations and uh, so I think there's a lot of work that could be done on things like the agency regulations for example without going into the boring detail of what exactly one of the things that I'm slightly pessimistic on is um, the UK government right now is so distracted with Brexit there's such an enormous amount of work to be done that I think things like this that are not not high up the agendas no one in particular advocating for them I just think that they're, they're going to continue to be kind of annoying annoying quirks of regulation that don't actually help anyone and so meanwhile we're having to shape our business model around that you spoke initially about pedagogy curriculum learning at home mm. do you get many informed customers across the heat map of London that you spoke about uh, and do they form your ideal customer well, I think it's it's interesting. What, what parents know and don't know is interesting. And um, I find I find there are two things which are may seem to be contradictory. What, on the one hand, you have parents who um, have a. I think pa- parents don't really know what they are, what they should be asking for. So parents, parents are not particularly informed consumers. I don't think of early years. But on the other hand, they really want to be. And where there's something that has broken through, they really grab onto that. So, for example, um, you'll hear a lot of people asking for Montessori or mentioning Steiner. And when you ask them, what do you like about it? Or what do you mean by that? Or you, you, you ask them to explain a little bit more about it. What emerges is that they don't really know what those things are. But they know that they are a thing. So there's a sort of a hunger for a system that someone has thought about um, without without being specific about what it is. So I don't think parents are kind of, I don't think parents are going down that next level and saying, you know, I want my child to be um, educated in a school which is play-based or based on phonics or for a, for a school that has the following philosophy. They're not going to that level of detail, but they do want it to, they do want someone to have thought about it. That's really interesting to know. You spoke a little bit about the external factors that are at play. Internally, as a business, uh, do you think you have locus of control on any of these factors, or are there any assets you wish you had as an entrepreneur in the next 12-month cycle? I think, we, um, I think Corrigus has a real role to play in um, decoding some of this stuff and helping parents figure out what they might want. So one of the things that we try to do is, um, in everything we do, is interpret uh, a lot of complex, boil down a lot of complexity, and try to put simple choices in front of people. And although we're not doing it now with, in, the, in, the, in the curriculum sense, I think that's what we absolutely could do, and I'd love to do that in the future for Corrigus. So I'd love to be able to say, you know, here's what we've taken from the philosophy of re or the philosophy of gentle parenting or the philosophy of Montessori, all these different kind of parenting and educational philosophies. And um, it may be that we emerge with something that is the Cory Kids way. So we say, you know, we've taken um, inspiration from these four different parenting philosophies or educational philosophies, and we've brought it into something which is one single philosophy, and here's what we stand for. It could be that we do that. It could be that instead we say, do you know what, we have nannies who are schooled in a more disciplinary and authoritarian mainstream school of nanny, and you can have one of those if you want. Or we have these other ones that are schooled in a more kind of progressive, gentle parenting school, and uh, some parents might like that. And you can kind of, and it's more that we are helpfully labeling what's out there rather than actually saying this is the one right way. And at the moment, I think what we're doing tends more towards the second. So we tend to understand what it is and then try and decode it for parents. Um, and the, that kind of work is something I'd love to do more of in the future. So what I'm hearing is a lot of research needs to go into the types of parenting and the types of care that a child can provide, can be provided with your assistance uh, while he or she's growing up. Yeah, one of the things that I think is really interesting, gap in research, is... Um, when you think of how much emphasis has been in primary education on what are the assessments, what are the attainment standards, I know a lot of people don't like the, the direction that primary school education has gone in with, with over-assessment, 
But the fact is there's been a huge amount of research and thinking into frameworks at primary school. And yet, in early years, I think there's been very little thought, relatively speaking. Much, much, much less thought. And um, I think a lot of people who are working in early years are kind of lacking the guidance that people in primary school get. And that's not because early years isn't important. You know, there's a lot of um, evidence that things that happen in the first three years of life are among the most determinative of brain structure and, um, and attachment and relationships and later mental health. It's an incredibly important period of life. And yet there doesn't seem to be that much policy on what is what is actually important. So, for example, there seems to be some good evidence that having a really responsive, securely attached caregiver is incredibly important for later mental health. And yet I'm not seeing that translating through to, to um, early years um, provision. It's not something that that is, I don't think, really emphasised. Right. And finally, what are the biggest goals for you over the next few months and the year as you shoot, go out and grow the business? Well, we're, we're, right now we're scaling up our after-school provision as right. much as we can, so um, that's definitely a goal. I think um, we're also um, figuring out what works in terms of matches for nanny share and mm -hmm. what works in terms of the families matching together and the nannies matching together with the family. And so I think um, for us, it's just getting ever more targeted and ever better at making that, that match between a family and a nanny and then supporting them to make that work. And figuring out that um, in a repeatable way is probably our major goal. Thank you, Rachel. I look forward to hearing more about how Coro Kids does and the products you roll out uh, as well as the research. Thank you. Cheers.